Jacob Ignatow, and Radha Mihalcha. This webinar is presented as part of our Sage Talks series, connecting you to influential authors one webinar at a time. I am pleased to introduce our speakers today. Gabe Ignatow is an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of North Texas, where he has taught since 2007. His research interests are in the areas of sociological theory, text mining and analysis methods, new media, and information policy. Radha Mihalcha is a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. Her research interests are in computational linguistics with a focus on lexical semantics, multilingual natural language processing, and computational social sciences. Gabe and Radha are co-authors of Text Mining, published by SAGE in 2016, and An Introduction to Text Mining, published by SAGE in 2017. Today's webinar will run about an hour and will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We'll be sending out a link to view that recording in the coming weeks. If you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. After the presentation, we have some time for Q&A, so please also use that Q&A box to ask any questions to our speakers throughout the webinar. And also take note of our webinar hashtag, Sage Talks, and feel free to ask questions and have conversations on Twitter. In today's discussion, Gabe and Rada will give an overview of text mining and hypothesis testing, and will discuss current methods, cutting edge methods, and tips for integrating text mining coverage into your course or program. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speakers, Gabe Ignatow and Rada Mihalcha. Gabe will begin our presentation today. Welcome, Gabe. Okay, so my name is Gabe Ignatow. I am a co-author of Text Mining, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today. First, I would like to thank uh, Sage, um, the entire Sage team, Rada, of course, my co-author, uh, Susanna, Helen, Michael, um, and everyone, uh, Sherry, and everyone who's been involved in this project. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Text Mining, how I got involved in Text Mining, um, starting about 20 years ago, um, and why we wrote, uh, co-authored these two books, and what we um, were trying to do for the last few years of my life uh, in writing these books. So I began uh, in text mining, and I'll keep this as brief as possible. Um, when my undergraduate advisor assigned me a book by George Lakoff, who's a cognitive linguist, um, and it was a really fascinating book about differences in the metaphorical language used by um, people who lean more conservative than people who lean more um, liberal, kind of red state versus blue state. And he assigned me what sounded like an easy task, which was to uh, come up with a kind of text analysis method um, that would allow us to automatically analyze political texts for ideological content and ideological position. That turned out to be very, very difficult. Um, but it was fascinating to me to think that you could understand a culture and understand um, the ideology and the lived experiences of a group of people uh, through their texts, through the kind of digital traces or the traces of their natural language. And this is before natural language processing and before big data um, really took off. So um, I started doing work in this area um, and then found as I started graduate school, that it was, I was still fascinated with text-based social science research, but it was very difficult um, to do this kind of research. There wasn't a lot of guidance. There weren't many templates for how to do it. So hence, uh, bullet point two, uh, sheer frustration. Um, so let's please move to the next slide. Okay, so I'm not going to bore the audience too much with my academic CV, but um, the, you'll see the, the papers I co-authored or authored uh, in red at the bottom. Uh, the first one was uh, my first text mining, text analysis paper, and it was a project I began in 1998. It was very data-driven. They're all method methodology papers, I would say, or sociology papers that are oriented towards text mining methodology. Um, I started that paper in 1998 and didn't finish it in 2003, and it was a brutal experience, and I just didn't think it should be this hard um, to write a text mining paper. An 8,000-word paper should not take five years. The next one was a little bit easier. It took me about a year to find the data, which was... Um, not digital. It was uh, transcriptions of um, in-person meetings of uh, shipyard workers from the 1970s. It's very hard to find natural language data at that time. And if you'll notice, um, just very briefly, I then 
didn't do any research in this area for about five years or didn't publish in this area for about five years, did other things. I think I was a little bit too far ahead of the curve and um, not in a good way. Uh, and then I got back into text mining, did a, a project, um, another uh, third project that was published in 2009. It went faster, everything was easier. Um, it was a, it's had higher impact, uh, greater impact than the other studies. Then took off another six years or so um, and did a, a series of other projects, uh, including the two books with Rod and the uh and a bunch of collaborative research projects. Um, I think we're now on a slide that is meant for RADA. Um, hey, sorry to interrupt. Just one second, folks. Um, Gabe, I, some of us are hearing a little bit of an echo. If possible, okay. um, it would be great if you could put on headphones or um, turn off your, the speaker on your phone um, so that we, we're just hearing your voice. Because we're, we're getting a little bit of, of an echo. I'm hearing from some of the members. Um, let me see. Yes. It seems like it is on my end. Folks, if you want to chime in, um, keep letting us know how the audio is. We really appreciate it and rely on you to know how we're doing along the way. Um, but it, on my end, yes, it sounds better. Better. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know also. Um, okay. So just very briefly, um, so in the course of the last 20 years of doing text mining research, I had these long breaks where I didn't do it. It was very difficult to do. Um, and I thought it shouldn't be this difficult. Um, and then as natural language processing developed and as uh, big data became available and as social media took off, uh, I started to think I want to get back into text mining. Um, you know, I got there early. There's so much better technology available. We know so much more about how language works. We know so much more uh, or have so many more tools for um, gaining access to text-based um, data or textual data. Uh, so I sort of got back into it. And then we ended up writing these books um, to try to make things easier for people, to make uh, things faster, to make this kind of research more efficient and also more um, productive. And I'll talk about some of the specifics here um, a little bit later, but I think it will now be Rada's turn in the next slide. Um, I'm Rada Niharcha. Um, I'm a professor in computer science and co-author of the Text Mining for Social Scientists books uh, together with Gabe. Um, and I'm very pleased to, to be here and have the opportunity to share with you some of the um, exciting things that we've been thinking about in this field of text mining for social sciences. Um, as for my interest in computational linguistics more broadly, I would go back even more than Gabe did and say that it started uh, from my early, um, from an early age uh, when I grew up in a, an environment that had uh, multiple languages being spoken. Um, and so I, I grew up with a passion for, for languages. Um, later on, I started loving math and even later getting into computer science. Um, and so computational linguistics, um, and for that matter, text mining, it was a natural intersection of, of language and computer science. Um, so that's what, that's what I do now. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so my research is primarily in natural language processing um, and text mining, and within that, uh, my lab works on three main areas. Uh, one is computational social science, and I'll say more about that in just a bit. Uh, we also work on multimodal behavior analysis, uh, where language is joined by other modality like facial expressions, uh, physiological sensing, and so forth, for the perspective of understanding people, um, and also conversational technologies. If we could move to the next slide, please. So within computational social science, um, there are projects that we work on that are very much at the intersection of natural language processing and social sciences. Um, just to sample a couple of projects we work on, for instance, uh, understanding people's values from the language they speak. Um, we have a lot of data that's collected from blogs and tweets uh, from US and India, and then we use methods that are described in our books for doing topic modeling and then inferring based on that what are the core values of these groups, um, how are these values manifested in day-to-day -day behaviors, and also what are the differences across cultures. Uh, we also have projects that try to understand people's worldview. Uh, for instance, if I say sun or bridge or university, um, do I see the same thing or do I intend the same thing that somebody from another country or another gender would intend? Um, and that's a project that aims on cross-cultural modeling of, um, of words and, and worldviews. Um, and I will leave it there for the sake of time. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. All 
Okay, so um, I spent years trying to figure out how to do text mining projects uh, for social science publication for social science audiences. And I think, looking back, the reason it was so difficult uh, early on, oops, can we just go back? Well, there you are. Um, is there are some basic kind of philosophical and logical issues that uh, I didn't know I had to deal with um, in setting up these kinds of research projects in terms of setting up a research design. Um, and these have to do with differences in how social science is um, performed in different kind of branches of social science, including within sociology, um, and some of the kind of philosophy of social science assumptions that go on um, before people even begin doing their research or they're sort of trained in these assumptions uh, in graduate school and then in their research careers. So what I found, just to keep this brief, is that um, in the social sciences and in sociology specifically, we tend to present our papers uh, as though they have followed a kind of hypothetical deductive model where you have theories and then you derive hypotheses from those theories and you test those hypotheses on data that you acquire um, and you acquire selectively and carefully in order to test the hypotheses. Uh, that's, um, in a nutshell, deduction. Deduction is very difficult, and this is all covered in the book in some detail uh, in, in some other publications. It's very difficult to accomplish with text-based research, including with uh, big data. We sort of swim in oceans of data. We can get any kind of data we want. Um, and language data is just so complex and so multifaceted uh, that it, it's very difficult to set up a kind of one-shot hypothesis test based on lang uh, linguistic data. Another approach is um, very appealing. The point two here is induction is very appealing to many social science researchers, including early career social scientists. Uh, the idea here is that you do research in a data-driven way. So you find data and then kind of go upwards from the data to theories. So uh, students are often very excited that they have found really cool, interesting data, um, interesting cases or large data sets, and they proceed with research kind of exploring um, of the data, and then they try to find theories that fit, uh, fit those theories to the data after working, choosing a method and choosing the data. Uh, in more qualitative forms of social science, we refer to kind of grounded theory and induction. Um, in more quantitative computational forms, it's uh, data mining. Um, those are very difficult. It's a very difficult path to take um, to have an impact in social science research um, doing data or, or social science text mining that way. The third one, uh, the third kind of logic of social science, and the one I think is most promising and most productive for text mining in the social sciences is abduction. And without going into a lengthy uh, philosophical discussion about it, it basically involves going back, being willing to go back and forth between theory and uh, analyzing your data uh, in an iterative way so that you, you start with some theory, theoretical background and some uh, knowledge of previous literature. You find your data. You explore it and you go kind of back and forth between theory and method until there's a pattern match, or between theory and data until the pattern um, of the theory matches the, what you have in the data, and then you've kind of discovered something. You've explained something. Um, there are some people in the London School of Economics in the UK and elsewhere who make this case that uh, abduction is really the preferred kind of a philosophical and logical approach for the social sciences. Um, so I think if that helps anyone out there, um, move forward in the research more quickly. Uh, I hope that will be the case. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not going to cover, this is all the content of uh, a large section of the book. Uh, these are the main current methods of text mining and text analysis in the social sciences. Each of these encompasses both text mining, which is, uh, refers to older methods of text-based social research, and text mining, which is, uh, refers to generally newer methods. Um, these are the, the big five for the most part, in, that are kind of accepted in the social sciences. And I think as we, um, as people teach this course, certainly as, as I've taught it, we cover all five of them. And we encourage students to choose the best one or maybe two um, for their particular research interests, for their purposes. I won't go with through each one, um, but I'll make a couple notes here on the slide. Um, for each, thematic analysis, narrative analysis, opinion mining, which refers to um, uh, kind of subjectivity analysis or sentiment analysis, metaphor analysis and topic models, there are more qualitative and interpretive sides, uh, particularly for um, thematic analysis, narrative analysis, and metaphor analysis. And then there are more computationally intensive, um, more quantitatively oriented ways to do this kind of research. But for all but um, opinion mining and topic models, they're, they're open to people with different kinds of um, backgrounds, whether you come from a humanities background or kind of literary studies or social science background. 
or more of a, a computer science uh, background, software development, or something like that. Um, they're all open to different kinds of researchers, and um, there are people doing work in each of these five areas with different backgrounds, most productively, I think, in collaboration. So that's where I'll stop there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So we, as Gay mentioned, there are a number of topics that we, we cover in the books. Um, for today's webinar, um, I wanted to go a little bit more in depth on three topics which I think are essential for any text mining process project in the social sciences. Um, one of them is text pre-processing. And pretty much any natural language processing slash text mining project would start with these uh, pre-processing steps, namely tokenization, normalization, and then lemmatization and stemming. Next slide, please. Um, so for tokenization, for instance, this has to do with separating punctuation from the tokens. Um, and here we talk about tokens, which are sequences of characters in a particular document, and then types, which will be the class of tokens that contain the same character sequence. Um, so for instance, if we have a text like I slept and then I dreamed, then the tokens would be I slept and then I dream, uh, but then there are fewer types. So I repeats twice, we only counted one for a type, slept, and then and dream. Um, the simplest way to go about tokenization is to just ignore everything that's punctuation, sometimes even numbers, uh, but there are also more sophisticated ways of going about that in the sense of having some special approach to address abbreviation, dates, special characters, and so forth. The other thing to note about tokenization is that it's language dependent. Um, so if we, next slide please, if we want to build a tool for tokenization for English, there are certain rules that one should observe. Uh, but then if we move to another language, and of course a lot of the interesting social science problems would cross different languages, then we'll have to build tools that are specific um, to those languages. Um, here is an example for, for French where we have a clitic or reduced definite article um, and they would have punctuation that's used for that. Even more challenging German, for instance, where we'll need a compound splitter to make sense of the individual words within this compound. Next slide, please. Another important step is normalization, um, which has to do with understanding what are terms that really mean the same thing. A simple example would be USA, spelling those two different forms. Um, in French, we'd have resume spelled with the diacritics or no diacritics. Um, and so there will be different steps that we'll have to take there for processing the text and going, for instance, from um, doing through casing for case folding, figuring out the different formats of the dates and, and so forth. Next slide, please. Another step is lemmatization, which has to do with finding the root form of a word. Um, if an example here, the boy's cars are different colors, we want to figure out how the plural for car or are is a form for the verb to be. And that is important because whenever we try to process text and for instance find distributions of words um, in text or find how values are being expressed in language, we do want to account for different forms of the same word, like colors, color, uh, or even for that matter, the British way of spelling color and, and so on. Next, next slide, next slide, please. Another common uh, pre-processing tool is stemming, and this is actually a very rule-based process that would truncate words, and that is fine when the end user is not a human. So for instance, if you build a text mining process that needs to understand that there are commonalities between words such as computer, computational, computation, then it will be perfectly fine to just truncate those, figure out that they have the same stem of compute, um, and do analysis on top of that in the sense of counting how many such compute-related words are in a text. Um, this, of course, is not the case when the end user is a human, then we cannot afford to do this non-linguistic ways of truncating words. Uh, but oftentimes, text mining processes um, will be built layer by layer, 
and one of the initial layers is often the um, stemming. Next slide, please. Another topic that we wanted to touch upon is lexical resources, uh, which are databases that contain information about words in language. Needless to say, these are language specific, so we have a number of lexical resources for English, there are some for Chinese, French, and so forth. Um, can we get to the next? So we have a variety of different lexical resources. There are dictionaries, which are simply alphabetical list of words in a language, and we have listing of those in the um, in the books. There are also thesauri, which group similar words in a language. Uh, one of the common ones used for English, for instance, and also other languages is WordNet, that would bring relations between words, finding synonyms, antonyms, um, causality relation between words, which can be particularly beneficial when we try to understand social relations, for instance, or social roles in a text. Um, there are also semantic networks that would define not only similar words, but also other kind of relations, such as ESA relation, um, and then concordances that would provide some information on what are typical contextual relation between words. Next slide, please. So here is the example that I mentioned, WordNet, which is one of the commonly used lexical resources for English and also for nearly 50 other languages. Um, in English, for instance, it has very wide coverage, 150,000 words grouped into synonym sets, uh, more than 100,000 synonym sets. Um, this is a 100% public resource for both research and commercial purposes. Um, it has APIs or interfaces in a number of programming languages, so it's very easy to use and also very easy to interact in an online setting. Next slide, please. So here is an um, example for what you could find for the word bench, for instance. You will find a variety of synonym sets uh, indicating the different meanings that this word can have, different definitions. Uh, then you can also see the noun meaning and the verb meaning, and then if you keep browsing the resource, you'll find what are more, form, more specific forms of bench, more general forms of bench, and so forth. Next slide, please. There are some other resources that are layered over WordNet, which we think are particularly useful for a social science project. One is WordNet domain, so this is an annotation on top of WordNet that would indicate the domain where different words belong. So you will find, for instance, what are some words that belong to the field of psychology, what are some words that belong to the field of history. Um, we also have um, words that would belong to art, and then going within that, so say we have all the words that belong to the domain of art, we can have subdomains like photography, theater, music, and so forth. This is also public. Um, and it's available from the link we provide here. Next slide, please. Another layer, which again is very useful for social science research, is WordNet Affect. These are emotion annotations on top of WordNet. So words are annotated with their emotional balance, um, emotions such as anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness. So a word such as happy, for instance, is labeled with a uh, label of joy, or a word such as uh, cry would be labeled with the label of sadness and, and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, along the same line, senti WordNet is another layer. This is a coarser classification of emotions, primarily focusing on whether a word is reflecting a positive or a negative emotion, without necessarily going to the point of indicating whether it's fear or sadness. Um, and this, again, it's a, um, it's a public resource. Next slide, please. Very commonly used um, in computational social science is the linguistic inquiry and word count. This is a resource that has been built at the University of Texas. Um, unfortunately, this is not really freely. Uh, one has to buy a license to use this resource. Um, it has around 100 psycholinguistic teams, so words would be grouped into categories, broadly into linguistic processes, psychological processes, personal concerns, and spoken categories. Next slide, please. And we'll find categories such as 
the category of words we, and within that we'll find our, ourselves, we, let's, and so forth. Uh, we have a category for achievement, and under that we'll find words such as better, word, ahead, and, and so on. And these are very often used for gaining insight into text. If we have, say, text that was written by third graders and we want to get an um, understanding of what are their concerns, the use of the linguistic inquiry and word count would allow us to group words into categories and see whether the primary concerns of these third graders through their language are more having to do with achievement or optimism or being self-centered or you-centered and so on. Next slide, please. Here is an example of an application that uh, we built on top using linguistic inquiry and word count where we looked at the presence of these word categories across the 50 states. And we see, for instance, words that reflect positive emotions, how they are distributed across the 50 states. Um, another example on the right side is words that have to do with money, how they are uh, distributed across the 50 states. Then we can also ask questions such as, do money bring happiness? And we can do correlates across the 50 states between positive emotion and money, and we see the answer is no because the correlation is negative. Next slide, please. We can then also ask the question, if money does not bring happiness, what does bring happiness? Um, and here is on the right side the map that we built for words that have to do with family. Uh, so this would be words such as husband, sister, brother, and so on. And their distribution across 50 states in blog data, and we see there is a, a strong positive correlation between positive emotions and, and family. Next slide, please. Just very briefly, another topic that we address in the book, and we think it's very um, often used in social science research, is text classification, where the goal is given a collection of texts to classify them with respect to a set of categories. Next slide, please. And we'll have instances of problems such as figuring out whether a text is about a certain topic, such as finance or sports, whether a text is a movie review or a news, or whether it expresses a positive or a negative opinion, whether it's spam or non-spam. Next, next slide, please. Here is an example of text that's written by two genders. So this would be text that we'll use for text classification for the purpose of gender detection, which would also go into authorship identification. Um, on the left, for instance, we'll have a woman author text. On the right, we'll have a male author text. And we can use this data to first gain insights into what are primary concerns of the two genders, uh, but also building tools that would allow us to identify the gender of, an, uh, of a new text. Next slide, please. Here is another example for deception detection. Uh, this is work that we've been doing in, in our research group for a while. Um, the example on the left is somebody who is truthful about their, um, their best friend. And on the right, we see the opposite, where somebody is lying about a person they cannot stand, but they describe them as their best friend. Um, and this kind of data allows us first to build classifiers uh, but also, like I said before, gaining insight by using lexical resources such as WordNet or linguistic inquiry and word count. We can now start to learn what are the clues of deception. Next slide, please. There are a variety of classification methods that we cover in the book. Um, one of them that I'll just mention briefly today is naive Bayes. Um, and this, we feel it's a technique that can be um, Implemented from scratch with very little programming, uh, programming knowledge, uh, but there are a number of other techniques that are available in off-the-shelf tools. If we go next slide, please. Um, so the naive Bayes classifier is based on the Bayes theorem, um, so it's very easy to understand, and that's something that we teach in our classes. Next slide, please. And one more. Next slide, please. Um, so it's being based on this Bayes theorem um, with very simple probabilities, we can learn what is the most likely class for a given text by calculating the likelihood of seeing a certain word in the category. Um, so on this slide, we basically have the entire naive Bayes algorithm uh, fitting in there, which can be it's the literal steps that one would have to take 
for creating an IE based classifier. Um, and this is described at more length um, in the book um, on how naive base can be implemented in practice. And in fact, it makes for a very nice assignment that students would have hands-on experience with building text mining tools for social science problems. For instance, detecting deception or finding distant differences between text that's authored by a younger writer or an older writer and so forth. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks, Rada. Um, in the time we have left, I just want to point to um, a couple of people who I think are doing cutting-edge text mining research within sociology. Um, and this is sort of in addition to the five major text mining methods or methodologies uh, that we have in the social sciences. Um, these are Nick Adams and Laura Nelson. Nick is at UC Berkeley and Laura Nelson is at, um, I believe, Northeastern University in Boston. But they're they're not developing brand new methods, but they're doing what many of us are trying to do, including Rada and myself, and that is to um, take NLP, natural, natural language processing tools, um, and big data resources and new computational technologies and apply them within social science research projects um, in new ways uh, that can be useful, that can kind of scale up. So, I mean, just in a nutshell, what Nick is doing is, um, it's different from what you've heard today but it's uh, trying to automate a kind of crowdsourcing um, procedure for analyzing large quantities of text. So you don't have to ideally anymore employ hundreds uh, or at least dozens of undergraduate students to analyze a large text uh, data source. You can do it online kind of through an Amazon Mechanical Turk type model, but with um, a greater validity and more checks uh, on the process. Um, so I would look him up if you're interested. And Laura Nelson is doing um, proposing and actually implementing a kind of um, inductive, uh, grounded theory approach to analyzing texts um, that brings scientific rigor and precision um, to that area of sociology. And she's studied the women's movement, various social movements, um, using this new method. So I, if you're interested, I would look her up too. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and just to, to give you guys, the audience, some uh, useful tips in terms of research and also teaching, um, just to give an, a, a metaphor, you know, from my experiences with text mining projects, uh, it's, it is like painting a house, I don't know if you've ever done that, painted the inside of a room, um, where most of the work is the taping or the planning for what you're doing. The actual scraping data and analyzing the data is probably the last 10%. Um, to have a successful research project, I think you have to do a lot of kind of pre-work, um, early stage work, pilot studies, um, understanding the literature and then designing a research project, uh, developing a very viable research design and getting a lot of feedback on that research design and then towards the end actually, um, shoot, not or towards the middle, um, choosing I would say uh, the, the most appropriate method, the most uh, viable data source, um, understanding all the, the parameters in terms of sampling and so forth. So do your homework ahead of time um, in doing these kinds of research projects. I think uh, if you instruct students to do that, uh, they end up with much better research projects. I think it's very difficult to start with data and, and kind of start exploring. Um, so next slide, please. And then uh, in terms of teaching tips, so um, as I've been teaching text mining at the graduate level to master's and PhD students for a few years, um, they're all social science students working in sociology, uh, library science, information science, political science, areas like that. Um, I think a big factor in teaching these kinds of courses is getting over people's fears that they don't have the um, kind of adequate computational skills or software background um, and that the, the barriers uh, to entry are too high for them. Um, so you have to, I find, try to meet students' expectations by giving them flexibility in terms of um, what is being taught and sort of giving them options uh, in terms of developing their own research projects. Um, I have developed a kind of hybrid course that's uh, mostly online, but it also has face-to-face, -face, uh, a face-to-face -face component where we meet as a group. It's uh, six or seven students and myself, um, and we share um, our experiences with uh, scraping data, with analyzing it, with applying NLP tools. I think that works well, but I'd be very interested to hear uh, from the audience in terms of um, teaching questions or teaching uh, tips. And then I think uh, something I'd like, this is looking to the future, um, to develop a methods module for mainstream social science courses where uh, I, in an ideal world every social science uh, undergraduate at least and certainly or graduate student at least and certainly uh, undergraduates as well um, would learn at least the basics of text mining 
Uh, I think they would gain very valuable skills, and I think this is the way the social sciences are going. Uh, so next slide, please. So just to point to a few things that could be done, um, the text mining for social sciences, it's very rich in terms of existing tools. Um, so for the purpose of teaching, one can use existing resources. Here is an example for lexical resources when um, students can browse online, WordNet, or linguistic inquiry and word count and understand better the structure of these resources. Um, similarly, there are online resources for machine learning or tech classification that one can use to explore. Next slide, please. Or there could also be um, hands-on exercises for understanding concepts um, that are relevant to learning. Here is an example I mentioned before, Naive Bayes, as a, one of the core techniques for text classification. And what I've been doing in my own classes is using examples like this one, where you have a toy example with a few documents that are very small that people can actually, students can actually work with uh, by doing counts by hand, uh, seeing how many times a certain word appears in a certain um, class. Here we have biology and computer science, the bio and CS, and actually running a naive base classifier from the beginning to the end, uh, but doing that by hand, which to me provides one of the uh, best ways to understand technology. Next slide, please. All right. Well, I think we're we're done with um, with your portion of the presentation. Um, do you want to um, say any just ending remarks before we uh, get to the Q and A portion? Do you want to go ahead, Rava? I think it's a really rich area. I'm fascinated. I'm coming as you figure out. I'm coming from the angle of computer science. Um, and I'm fascinated by how much we can learn at the intersection of computer science and social sciences broadly, and specifically within my own area of expertise, natural language processing. Um, I, I feel there is a lot that we still have to discover. Um, so there is a lot of room for people to do research, for students to learn, for big problems to be solved with, with techniques from this um, area. So I would encourage people to explore more um, not necessarily through what we have to say, but what others have to say in the um, area of text mining for, for social scientists. Right. And I would just add that I think the great challenge for social scientists who are interested in working with these methods and, and these new forms of data, mostly from online sources, is um, to realize we won't always be preaching to the crowd, or to the choir, I should say. Uh, that, that we have to develop research designs and research projects that demonstrate the value of these methods to social scientists who might not otherwise be interested and might not be interested in the latest shiny toy, um, but want to learn about the way the social world really works and they want um, genuine scientific contributions to their literature. So we have to uh, do everything we can to do the best possible research with these methods. And I think there's um, a lot of potential uh, for us to develop further. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Gabe and Rada, um, for that very informative presentation. Um, we are going to spend the next, well, the remainder of the hour um, addressing some of the questions from our audience. And a lot of folks have been um, sending in questions, so I'll get to those in just a minute. Um, please continue, folks, to send those questions in. Um, also, if you are on Twitter, you can use the hashtag SageTalks um, to ask questions there. We'll be scanning that hashtag. And any questions that we don't get to um, in the rest of our time today, Gabe and Rada have kindly agreed to address them later uh, in a follow-up blog post on Method Space, which is Sage's online community. So um, let's get started. We've had um, some questions around just kind of the ethical considerations that must be kept in mind when doing this type of work. Um, and I was wondering if both of you um, would speak on that. And let's, let's start with Gabe, and then, you know, Radha, you can add anything afterwards. Right. I mean, those are super important questions, um, and they've proven very difficult for a lot of uh, well-informed people to, to sort out. So um, we have a, an entire chapter in the Introduction to Text Mining book on research ethics, and that absolutely has to be there. And that really is a, a living document, or it should be, because um, institutional review boards at universities are, are still developing standards for privacy. I mean, this is obviously a, top, a very hot topic right now, given Facebook's been going on to Facebook and other companies. 
Um, but you know, it's even for an undergraduate research project, you know, is it okay to go online and scrape someone's Twitter feed and uh, use it for a research project um, and maybe post that research project online? It's not, it's not at all clear. Um, and there are standards, uh, for example, put forth by organizations like the Association of Internet Researchers. And I would encourage uh, student, students and audience members um, to go to their website and find uh, their sort of um, list of ethical principles um, in terms of privacy, um, non-harm, and so forth. Um, but what we're finding is that um, ethical principles for social research that were developed in the 20th century uh, in response to World War II and, and other historical events uh, are not um, entirely appropriate or suited to um, Internet research. So generally, and to text mining specifically, um, so I always, for any project, I would go to your institutional review board, obviously, uh, at your university, if you're working at a university, uh, follow best practices uh, of your industry or your uh, industry association, if you're working in the private sector. Um, and, um, and yeah, read that chapter in the book, uh, which we will continue to work on because um, these standards are evolving quickly. And if I may, I would also bring two related um, topics which the computer science community is actively thinking about. Um, one is privacy, um, privacy broadly, but specifically also with regards to data and how differential privacy can offer solutions to that. And that's specifically applicable when you have very large data sets. How can you use this data without getting to the identity of any individual in your data? Um, and there is new interesting research, but it's an ongoing research problem, um, and I think we'll see more solutions there. Um, and another topic that has been receiving a lot of attention um, is algorithm bias, which really doesn't have to do that much with ethical concerns with respect to the individuals that have data, but really with how we replicate biases that already exist in, in our world through the use of algorithms. And that's very much applicable when we think about text mining. Say if we find, for instance, some gender um, differentiation or gender bias in data that has to do with certain um, areas of the real world, if we build tools around that, we want to take active steps to eliminate those biases. Even if the biases are real, um, the algorithms actually have the potential to remove them so we don't propagate the bias that we already have as a society. And that's already um, a research area that's been receiving attention and there is more work coming up, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Rana, another question um, that seems like it would be in your wheelhouse. Um, we got an inquiry from an audience member about um, the future of AI for large data sets. Um, do you have anything um, that, that you, know, you, you see coming um, in the future of text mining um, with regards to the use of AI? That's a question that I'm hearing quite often lately. Um, I think it also has to do with how much attention AI has been getting. And what I really think about AI is that AI should not necessarily stand for artificial intelligence, which is, of course, the current interpretation of AI, um, but rather augmenting intelligence. And so I think there is a lot of potential of learning for very large text collections through text mining in a way that would augment us, so we'll become better humans uh, through these tools, as opposed to replacing us. And that's my, my view of the immediate future for, for AI. It's growing us in ways that we haven't even dreamed before, uh, but not replacing us. Thank you. Anything to add there, Gabe, or did Rada cover most of it? No, I, I don't think we're, at, I agree with Rada 100%. I don't think um, our skills are at risk of being um, eliminated, or the human isn't at risk of being eliminated in, in um, many areas, but anything that can be um, automated and, and routinized is at risk uh, of um, being subject to AI. So maybe there'll be a, a greater, uh, or I think already this is the case, a greater emphasis and a greater value placed on uh, innovation and creativity and um, thinking differently. But uh, in terms of uh, what AI will do to um, text mining technologies, I, I don't know. Um, 
but there there are some things about the social social science research that I think will, don't change and won't change, and there's some basic fundamental knowledge um, that will always be needed, no matter what technologies we're using. All right, thank you. We've gotten a few questions about the use of tools or software that you recommend for somebody just getting started on their text mining journey. Um, Gabe, are there any specific tools or software um, packages that you'd like to mention to this audience? Right, I think um, there are some Chrome add-ons for scraping data. There's uh, the first web scraper I used was a Helium scraper after kind of, this is three or four years ago, uh, doing a, a kind of survey of the available uh, software, which we did a, in the book again um, as an appendix. But uh, I found Helium Scraper to be to be super useful. I'm not someone who came in with a Python background. I learned a little bit along the way, but I actually found it better and and more powerful to use off the shelf uh, web scraping tech technology just to create data sets um, than it was to use um, Python. Or actually, Rada was involved in this using um, Perl at the time, um, just because of the structure of uh, websites that uh, contain um, uh, archives of user comments. So I think finding a, a good web scraping technology um, for a beginner student, um, you know, it's worth it to put in a couple of weeks uh, to learn some of these uh, these tools, um, to go to YouTube or to go to online videos and um, just learn how to use them because at least I find with my students, they, they kind of gravitate back to uh, copying and pasting and we, we don't want you to do that. I mean, of course, you can always get data that way, um, but you should, once you learn to master one kind of web scraping uh, technology, um, I think you're much more powerful in terms of um, the kind of data you can acquire. The whole internet starts to open up to you. Uh, then in terms of um, analysis packages, I mean, it really depends on the, your research design and then where you go um, in terms of uh, the, the data you have and what you want to do with it. Um, for many people, uh, a QDA package will be enough, and, and there are QDA packages that have lots of um, bells and whistles for analytics. So. Uh, I'm referring to qualitative data analysis software. Um, it's basically used to organize um, human interpretation of text, but there's more you can do than that um, with some of those packages. We discuss those in the book, but uh, you know you can uh, you can search and to find the best one for yourself. Um, and then you start to get to a point where you'll need uh, specialized software, or it may be worth spending a few months uh, learning Python, definitely learning R um, for statistical analysis. Um, and kind of getting further into it. Um, but it also depends on your kind of career uh, schedule and how much time, for example, you have uh, in your academic program to complete a project. So, um, you know, time, time management is tough when you're learning these new technologies. But um, I'd be happy to answer, you know, give lists of uh, software that I prefer uh, by email or in the blog or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Rada, a question that has come up for you. Um, you were talking in your presentation a bit about gender classification, um, and, and one person inquired, um, what key characteristics within text help determine if the individual writing it is male or female? Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, and it's one of the problems that I actually like to talk about, uh, mainly because of the findings. So one can find uh, more intuitive things in the sense of topics that the two genders are more interested in. So you might find more conversation about um, cars and engines, say, in the uh, male author text, and you might find um, more things that have to do with, without putting out any stereotypes, I don't know, maybe um, fashion or um, I don't know, what would be real estate or topics that you'll, where you'll find more women. Uh, but the interesting thing is that you, some of the clues that help you distinguish between text oftentimes do not have to do with this surface form. Um, so for instance, um, it was found that men would more often use the word off, which is unintuitive. I mean, we don't even count that. When I hear you speak, I don't count how many times you say off. Um, or also counterintuitively, it was found that men would more often use the word we, whereas women would more often use the word I. And there are psychological explanations for why that happens. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make is that with this kind of analysis that we can now do, uh, we can actually go beyond the surface. 
So when you ask somebody what's the distinction that you will find between male author text versus female author text, they will probably come up with some kind of stereotypes, what are the words that are more often associated with the genders. Uh, but computers can actually go deeper and discover even more interesting uh, associations. Uh, we found in some previous work a uh, clear distinction between the kind of colors, like colored names that are preferred by the two genders, um, temporal expressions, um, social relations. So it's a lot of interesting, there are a lot of interesting I think that one can discover um, going beyond the surface. All right, thank you. This may, may be our last audience question that we have time for today before we um, finish up here. But I just wanted to throw this out to both of you. Um, this is encompassing actually a few questions that I've been asked in this process. Um, a lot of people are asking how they can apply text mining um, in, in their own course across disciplines. Um, we have people who are inquiring about using this in their public admin course, in their education course, um, in healthcare. Um, do you have any pointers uh, for maybe ways that this would be integrated into a course differently across disciplines? Um, or or any any comments on that? We'll start with Gabe. Well, I think uh, examples of research uh, that use text mining tools and text analysis techniques from all of those three areas you mentioned, and pretty much every social science uh, discipline and sub-discipline. So there are people using these tools. Um, these publications have mostly come out in the last five to ten years. Um, we have some of them in the book, but you can, you can, you know, if you're clever, you can uh, find them if you use the right keywords. Uh, it's not always that easy because these papers don't always emphasize or, or highlight the method. They highlight the substantive uh, findings and, of course, the theories. Um, so this has all been being done. Um, it's, nothing, it's nothing new. Um, in terms of uh, teaching it to different audiences, I think, uh, depend, you have to get to know your students. Um, it really depends on what kinds of uh, uh, skills they have coming in, what their timeline is for completing a project. Um, but you know, there are relatively short-term projects you can do with text mining to, to give people skills um, and give them a, just a feel for research and uh, let them have at least a, a good research paper coming out of a, a semester or as part of a course. Um, you know, to be able to scrape some data, to think through what the research design should look like, what the research questions are, um, and to select the right method and at least do a pilot study. I think you can do that in any um, advanced undergrad or grad course um, in pretty much any social science related uh, discipline. Okay, thanks Gabe. The first part of your answer got cut off, um, but that's okay because uh, you two have kindly volunteered to answer questions um, in a follow-up blog post, so um, we'll make sure to address this one uh, as well in full um, later. Radha, do you have another comment um, for another 30 seconds to a minute before we wrap up? I was just going to add to what we were discussing earlier. I think the techniques for text mining are pretty generalizable, and so one, getting familiar with them would give you a lot of power, um, and then moving to different domains would really be a matter of getting the right data. Um, which I think is a challenge in itself. Uh, but in our, in my field, we have a saying, there is no better data than more data. So for instance, if you want to do something in health, you need some health data. And once you get a hold of that, then a lot of the techniques that you apply in a previous domain would be straightforwardly applicable there. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that comment. I think that's a perfect way to end it. Um, and that's just about all the time we have for today. Um, so thank you all for hanging with us. If you are interested in purchasing either um, book on the screen in front of you, you can use code TEXTMINING on sagepub.com, and you can purchase either of those books at a 20% discount. Um, that code is going to be good through May 5th. If you are an instructor considering one of these books for use in your course, you can feel free to request a copy uh, at sagepub.com. And just to distinguish between the two, the book on the left, Text Mining, um, is intended for more advanced students and researchers. The book on the right, An Introduction to Text Mining, is appropriate for undergraduates or first year graduate uh, social science and data science courses. Okay, folks, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, again, special thank you to authors Gabe Ignatow and Radha Mihalcha. Everyone, please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to today's uh, webinar, as well as questions we didn't have time to get to today. And please stay connected with us for information about upcoming webinars 
and follow us on Twitter at sage underscore methods. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.